thank you so much for coming out to see us. Wow. Again. <laughs> Without you, we wouldn't be here. Exactly. We we would, would be 55 the years later, we wouldn't be here. Thank you so much for your support of our program. 55 years. That's crazy. Who would have thunk that this little movie that you guys made would have such an impact and stand the test of time this long? The, o the only one of our group who, sure. who claimed. <laughs> Oh, sorry. The only one of our group who claims that he was clairvoyant enough to realize that 55 years after the fact we would still be getting together to talk about Night of the Living Dead is John Russo. The rest of us, frankly, from George on down, had no clue. All, we were just a group of young energetic filmmakers uh, who decided that they didn't want to do TV commercials anymore and uh, business films and that kind of thing that we wanted to make a real movie. And the real movie turned out to be Night of the Living Dead. So this is such an iconic, legendary, revolutionary film. Let's go back to the beginning of you shooting it, if you remember. Do you guys have any recollection of the first scene you got to shoot? We know exactly what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 no, I don't. Do you have any Actually, in the opening sequence of the car, which is supposed to have Barbara and John in it, was actually Gary Striner and me. Because there was no close-up really? of, of us. So we were the ones in the car chatting about this and that, everything. And uh, so that's something I don't believe I've ever shared that with anybody. I know, oh, I never knew that. Yes. Wow. Well, <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I think my first shot, I was running in the woods. And I had bare feet, or at least one bare foot. <laughs> But yeah, I remember running in the woods and then running along a road where George Romero was in the trunk of a Lincoln Continental. <laughs> the bonnet is up and he's filming as I'm running hellbent down the road. <laughs> the first dialogue sequence was the cemetery sequence between Johnny and Barbara. And that was uh, the f very first day of filming, along with the other shots that they're mentioning with Gary driving the car uh, with Judy in it. And um, we didn't get finished with the, f the cemetery scene the very first day. And so we kept putting it off, the finishing of the, that scene, kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. So consequently, it was the very first day of filming and it was the very last day of filming. And in between time, about three months had elapsed. Uh, we started filming in early June of 1967 and it was uh, in getting into October, about this time, maybe even a little bit later in October, by the time we finished filming. And this was southwestern Pennsylvania, where the weather is slightly different than it is here in Texas. <laughs> Between June 1st and uh, let's say middle of October, by the time we got to the, the middle of October shots, that these scenes had to be edited together, uh, it was cold and it was rainy, and we had to be careful because sometimes you could see vapor coming out of our mouths, <laughs> which is, is hard to work around. Yeah. And we, it, it was also threatening with rain. So we had to do something to cover whether it was actually going to be raining or not. But 
you don't need to know all of that minutia, but coincidentally, it, the, that cemetery scene embodies both the very first day of filming and the very last day of filming. And what does it feel like to be part of such a pivotal movie now? Now that you saw what it grew into, and it means so much to so many people for the last 55 years. It feels kind of surreal. Um, I, well, I was nine years old. Um, I was nine years old when we shot the film, and I, of course, as Russ said, never entered my mind that I would be sitting here 55 years later. You know, like it just. This stuff didn't happen though either at that time, so none of us could have, except for Jack, could have you know, foreseen where we would be now. But I feel honestly like I'm one of the luckiest people on on earth. I really do. I mean, you know, I I was a nine year old kid plucked out of like my life for you know not for very long for like a day or two here and there, and uh, like out, out of all the billions of people on planet Earth. I'm here for this, and it's like, how did I get this lucky? It's amazing, because it really is like, the, the word blessing is so overused, but honestly, that's how I view this. It is a blessing, and I wouldn't be here meeting all of you really wonderful people, you guys, I, you know, like, come on now. <laughs> and um, it's just, it's amazing. It's fantastic, I'm lucky, and Explain, I'm so grateful. Explain the rigorous casting session that you had to go through. Oh, yes. I, I woke up one morning and my mother said, you're going to be in a movie. What? This kid Dad's crushed on me. a movie. So yeah. I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? I'm not an actor. Not yet. Yeah, so, no, I'm still not. So, <laughs> but it was, you know, it was amazing. And I, even I, <laughs> well, I, I worked at Lady Village, and so I saw George and Russ and Jack every single day. And I actually did read for the part of Barbara, but as I've said on other occasions, I was dreadful. And um, they, they they wrote this part. I guess they needed they needed a, a lighter, you know, younger couple in the film to kind of round things out. So, uh, and they knew me and they liked me and uh, that's how I got to be in that in film. And th through no talent of my own, really. Just, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And uh, they were all just great, great people. Every Everyone there was just, uh, I look back on them. I'm, just, I'm very happy that it was part of my history. And, uh, and I feel very fortunate to be here. I, not something that I ever imagined. And I put it off for a long time, and it was uh, my children who said, Mom, you really need to do this. So that's how it, I came to be a guest at one of the, I think it was Dallas, was my first show. Yes. To have this be a legacy, is a, it's, it's awesome to me. I always, since I was a little girl, wanted to be on the stage, wanted to perform. I would sing and practice before I could even go to school and read. And to actually, at 23 years old, be cast in her first feature film was a thrill. Every minute we were there, whether it was in the middle of the night or the middle of a hot, hot day in the summer, we gave it 150, 200% or more of our love, our energy, our desire to make something that we never thought it would go beyond, but we wanted to make something good with what we had. We wanted to do the best we could do with our own knowledge at the time. That's what we did. It has changed my life incredibly. Let me give you one example, if I may. Not only have I acted on the stage and on screen, but I've also had a communications company. 
where I've helped executives stand up and present. I have taught a lot of those executives and the engineers over the years. What I found, and this, is, this blows my mind, I would come into the first class, we had six classes in this whole sec uh, the, the whole course. I'd introduce and say hello, and it was so nice to have you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Somebody would say, w "Were you Barbara?" <laughs> and I'd say, oh, "How did you find that out?" Yes. <laughs> Do you know from that time on, people that my the attendees seemed to listen a little bit harder. <laughs> Maybe she has something of value to give. <laughs> Amazing. After all those years, that truly is how it affected me. That it, it would change these adult executives and engineers. Oh, God, were you in my <laughs> roughly 10 years before uh, we made Night of the Living Dead. And I met him through the most odd circumstances. Uh, George grew up in the Bronx in New York, and he came to Pittsburgh to go to uh, Carnegie Mellon University, then Carnegie Tech, as a painting and design major. Uh, and a mutual friend of ours, Rudy Ritchie. Rudy and I were in a uh, performance, uh, a live performance uh, at the Pittsburgh Playhouse, which at the time was a very, very active community theater nationally. And we were in some uh, silly farce comedy. And uh, Rudy wanted to bring his friend who Rudy was also in the painting and design program, and uh, he was doing acting uh, uh, at, in the evening. And he said, I'd like to bring a friend of mine over to meet you guys, uh, George Romero. He's, but he's a little bit strange, but he didn't explain exactly how strange George was. <laughs> so, uh, George had a knack for falling in love with movies and with movie characters. And at this point in time, he happened to have fallen in love with a movie called Cyrano de Bergerac, uh, Jose Ferrer playing the lead character in Cyrano. After the show, into our dressing room, uh, Rudy and I were sharing a dressing room with a few other people, uh, comes George Romero dressed in a black satin cape with a red satin lining <laughs> spouting lines from Cyrano de Bergerac. <laughs> Magnificent, my nose. And, and, and he had all the dialogue down and he would work his way, not that particular night, but he, he worked his way through characters he landed on Marlon Brando, and, and Brando was one of his favorites, everything from Z Viva Zapata. So depending on what movie was in George's favorable list at the time, uh, you might find yourself talking to Marlon Brando or Cyrano de Bergerac or <laughs> you name it. Uh, but that's how I first got to meet him. And a few months later, George contacted me and said, I'm making a movie, uh, it, it, which is his first 16 millimeter movie. I knew nothing about movies, and I mean literally nothing. I didn't know which end of the camera you were supposed to point. But he wanted me to be an actor in a movie called Expostulations, which I did 
and the very first day of shooting, I became enamored with the production process. And George and I started to hang out, and about 10 years later, we completed our first real movie, uh, being Night of the Living Dead. Let's open it up to the audience. Do we have any questions? Oh, come on, don't be shy. Now I can't see the back row, so I'm gonna stand up. No, really? Okay, there we go. So, it's just a little tiny thing, but like, when you when you pull the emergency brake on the, on the car to release it, and it crashes into the tree, was the car already damaged, or did y'all wreck the car? <laughs> <laughs> Russ wants to jump right in. <laughs> Since you were looking at me, I get the first. <laughs> you were behind the wheel. I was behind the wheel. You're absolutely right. That car belonged to Russ and uh, Gary's mother. <laughs> we, and they said, Mom, we're, we're going to borrow the car for a little while. <laughs> and they were really told her what we were going to do. <laughs> We did not, I, now you'll have to correct me here, we did not injure the car. The car was damaged the, the... Prior to, well, as, as I mentioned before, uh, it, the cemetery scene was both the first and last day. Uh, and there, there must have been uh, probably three months span between those dates. My mother was driving her car back and forth to work, obviously, uh, during that three month interim, and someone crashed into her and wrecked her car. So Gary and I persuaded her, don't get it repaired just yet. <laughs> because we have to figure out a way to stop the car in the movie that we're making. So you can pick it up from there. Because of course we had filmed the, the beginning of that scene when it's all whole and clean, and yet we finally come back after the crash car. To me, that the way George filmed that was so wonderfully done. When you look at it, I look at it, I don't know how many times, but I swear that that car was damaged by the tree that I ran into. <laughs> it was so well choreographed. And that's how we got rid of the, the crash. There's <laughs> a strongest car. <laughs> the only thing that we did, my, my mother obviously knew about the damage and so forth, and then she eventually got her, her car repaired. I wish that we still had that car. I wish that it would be, it, the foresight to put it in a plastic bag, it would be a very valuable deal. <laughs> Jack Russo would have. <laughs> the, the thing that my mother didn't know is that she didn't know that when Bill Heinzman, the cemetery ghoul, was trying to get after Barbara, that the passenger side window was going to be broken by Bill Heinzman slamming a rock into it. She didn't know that until she saw the movie in the movie theater the first night the, the, the premiere of Night of the Living Dead. My brother Gary had the, the uh, wits and foresight to, before we the filming, he went to a scrapyard that was not too far from our house and he bought a replacement window. So we were able to pull a fast one on my mother and re replace the window before she knew anything happened to her. And speaking of the premiere, do you guys have any memories from the premiere? Did you get to attend? in the film because of course the, all that time had passed 
but I, we were allowed to invite just a few select friends. How exciting that was. I, I can remember that night holding that drink, talking to Gwen, laughing, laughing. But what is the most exciting? 55 years ago tomorrow will be exactly. Yeah, that's right. 55 years uh, tomorrow night. back in Pittsburgh at what was the Stanley Theater, but it is now the Bayern Theater in Pittsburgh. It, it was as surreal and wonderful and as exciting as the original premiere was. I can remember standing on that stage with my arms out thinking, oh my God, we were, we were here 50 years ago. A lot of, a lot of good memories over those years. Uh, again, you have to remember, uh, I think it was Rudy Ritchie, a friend of ours who I, I mentioned that I was in the show with, Rudy was um, a very, very talented writer who unfortunately squandered most of his talent uh, as a writer. He felt, uh, although he was a close friend of ours, he felt that Night of the Living Dead was beneath our uh, intellectual capabilities. He looked at it as a, uh, a B movie and uh, he was a little more high-minded about what we should all be doing with our careers, completely overlooking the fact that um, this was our first time out of the gate um, and if we didn't treat Night of the Living Dead seriously, probably no one else would. And that's why uh, Carl Hardman, uh, who was Kyra's real life father, uh, John Russo and I 
decided that we were going to, uh, Carl and I uh, co-produced it, and obviously Russo was the co-writer with George. If we didn't treat it seriously, probably nobody else would, including the media. And that is one of the reasons why we made such a big hoopla out of the opening. It was the first complete feature film that was filmed in Pittsburgh. And we were able to rouse up enough media interest in, of all things, a horror film. But that particular spectacular launch of Pittsburgh's first full-length feature film uh, did indeed pay off. The one downside to the premiere was that my grandmother uh, was in the audience. She knew that we were working on a film. She had no idea what the, the subject was. She just knew that we were making a movie. So here's her grandson, Russell, in the first seven or nine minutes of the film. Uh, getting into a tussle uh, in the cemetery and out of the dark, there were 1,400 people at the premiere and out of the darkness you hear this little uh, grandmotherly voice when Bill Heinzman and I were fighting, Russell, he broke your glasses. <laughs> The, the reaction from the live audience was the exactly the same reaction that you just provided. So, my grandmother did not, I don't believe she saw the rest of the film. That, that, that was her. Russell got his glasses broken and then his head hit on a tombstone. Forget it. Grandma Striner is out of here. <laughs> Answer this question, but it's about the main character played by Dwayne Jones. Uh, up until then, we hadn't seen like a whole lot of strong African American heroes portrayed on the screen. And so, my question is when Russo and Romero wrote the screenplay, did they intentionally write the main character as a black character? And if so, were they trying to make a, a statement about racism in the country at the time? No, no, not at all. And Yes, I'll defer to Russ because he has far more detail. But that never came into play. In fact, uh, it was just a, a generic writing of a, of a truck driver, I believe, at that time, to play the role. How Dwayne got the role is, I don't know if, if you've heard that story before, but I'll turn it over to Russ. He, he knows the details. Dwayne, bottom line, had the best audition of all the people who auditioned for it. And there were good old white boys in there auditioning too. Mm. Dwayne was the best, and we wanted the best. That's awesome. I've mentioned a few times the name Rudy Ritchie, um, and he was a close friend of ours, and it was kind of, and, and Rudy was also a pretty decent actor. Um, and it was assumed by us and by Rudy that Rudy would probably play the character of Ben. Except, as I said before, Rudy had this kind of disdain for the genre. Uh, and his disdain came through and even though he was a friend of ours, we decided we were going to look at other people to play the character of Ben. Dwayne Jones grew up in a suburb of Pittsburgh, but we didn't know him at the time. Uh, he grew up in Pittsburgh and then moved off to New York. We had a mutual friend by the name of Betty Ellen Hawkey. She knew Dwayne in New York and she knew us. Easter Sunday, Easter weekend of 1967, Dwayne was coming back to Pittsburgh to visit his family for Easter. And through the good efforts of Betty Ellen, 
uh, knowing both Dwayne and us, arranged for him to audition while he was in Pittsburgh over that Easter weekend. And as soon as Dwayne read, we knew that he had to be Ben. And even Rudy agreed, and vo Rudy voted uh, that Dwayne should be the, the Ben character. And it was on that weekend that he was cast. I did see it, <laughs> and um, a very long, painful, convoluted story about <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the loss of the original copyright uh, to Night of the Living Dead under the copyright law that was uh, prevailed in 1968, uh, if you put out a book or a record or a movie, whatever, without a copyright notice on it, uh, you lost your, your copyright forever. That law has since changed. Uh, and Night of the Living Dead was one of the reasons why the copyright law was changed. Um, the title I told you it's a little long and painful. Um, when Night of the Living, or when, when Latent Image first decided that we were going to do a horror film, a scary movie, nobody knew exactly what it was going to be. So our business manager, a, a guy who really kept us together, a fellow by the name of Vince Servinsky, he opened a job jacket at Latent Image called Monster Fleck. So that was technically the first name for Night of the Living Dead, but obviously I think Monster Flick is not very commercial. So we put attached a working title to it called Night of the Flesh Eaters. And as publicity started to come out about this group in Pittsburgh is making a movie called Night of the Flesh Eaters, we get a cease and desist letter from an attorney saying, my client has a movie called The Flesh Eaters and stop using it, you're confusing the public and this and that and the other thing. Well, we didn't want our first movie out of the gate. We didn't want to start off with a series of lawsuits. So um, George suggested, why don't we put a title on it that nobody knows? We put a title on it called Night of Anubis. Anubis being the Egyptian, one of the Egyptian gods of the dead. So the very first complete print of the movie had the title Night of Anubis along with a copyright. Okay, fine. We take it out and try to round up a distribution deal, which we did, but the distributor said, Anubis, what the hell is Anubis? Nobody is going to come to a movie called Anubis. Get out of here. And that's when we put the title Night of the Living Dead on it. And it was their responsibility, the distributor's responsibility, to put the copyright that was on Anubis, put it on Night of the Living Dead, and they failed to do that. And that opened... 50 years of nightmares for us, uh, to be honest. But that's that's how the long, painful story as to how Night of the Living Dead got released without a copyright on it. And we didn't see any of the distributor's prints until the night of the, or the afternoon of the premiere. We're looking at the movie, where the hell did Anubis copyright go? It's gone. <laughs> And it was absolutely too late to do anything about it. So here we are. We made these big plans for an opening premiere, and the distributors' first prints come in without a copyright on it. So that, again, long, painful story. Yeah. Uh, casting the ghouls. How did that go? How did, how did casting the ghouls go? Gee, um, I don't know. Do you have any insight on that? <laughs> 
by the time, um, as I said, George and I, uh, through the latent image and through Hardman Associates, um, we had pretty good reputations in Pittsburgh for doing productions. Uh, we recruited a lot of our advertising clients to be ghouls. And it became kind of a social statement. Have you been invited to be a ghoul yet? <laughs> What's wrong with you? I'm gonna be a ghoul, I'm gonna be a ghoul. And to be honest, we had all of the, the ghouls that we needed and all the ghouls got paid $25, but many, many, many of them were our real life advertising clients, not only of the uh, late image, but of Hardman Associates as well. And a lot of the others you see in the background, my father was in it, my English teacher's father, <laughs> a gourmet cook, the owner of Pancock Ford. <laughs> we had anybody and everybody. When George said, we need a few more bodies for the posse scene we're gonna to shoot tomorrow. Boy, we just call up. Yeah. Your bridge partners or your golf buddies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, it read, and we have a, a fun movie with George. Favorite, favorite memory of working with George or Dwayne? Or both. Go. Why are you looking at me? Stop looking at me. Um, I, I remember the night that my dad got shot. That was fun. Um, <laughs> because he didn't really die. So, um, but I, I was out there the night that they did the scene between Wayne and, and my dad. And my dad, you know, a, a shot would go off, and my dad would try to stumble down the stairs, but he kept getting caught in that coat tree. And it kept following him, you know, around the corner. And uh, they, how many times did they redo that scene? And everyone was laughing, like, hysterically. I don't know how anyone kept a straight face during the final, you know, the final scene that they did. But it was very, very funny. So when I see the, the scene, it, it, when I was younger, it used to bother me seeing the shot. But now, I, you know, I harken back to that that ridiculous coat tree incident and like <laughs> repetitive coat tree incident <laughs> and um, it just makes me laugh now so people think I'm you know, nuts when I laugh when I see my head. That was, was one of the longest dying sequences <laughs> filmed in the <laughs> <laughs> It's going down the stairs. <laughs> George's creativity, the, the older I get, the more often I see the film, I, I see what he brought to it that helped make it the unique film that it is. Funny man, 
easy to work with, at least I found so. He gave us actors a freedom to be in a scene. He said, here's what I'd like to accomplish. We don't have much dialogue, but if you want to improvise, you can. So we did improvise some of the dialogue. There was a, a great deal of freedom, which did, you didn't often have, especially in a stage show or something like that. But he also taught me how to load film cartridges in a black bag. And when you're away from the studio and you have to, you have, to have that, that film stock ready to go, he taught me how to do that. I was scared to death that I would make a mistake and we'd ruin some of the film. You didn't have film to ruin. But what a memory that was of his showing me how to work in that bag, getting that thing all wrapped up. <laughs> Fortunately, we didn't lose any stock. <laughs> uh, to follow up on, uh, some of us spent nights, I didn't spend too many, but George and John Russo and a few others did spend nights in the house. Uh, first of all, we didn't have security, so somebody had to keep an eye on all the equipment and so forth. Uh, George uh, was lucky, he didn't have a sleeping bag, he had a cot. And our nickname for George was Bocat. And as soon, now remember, George was six foot four, a large guy. Uh, he took a look at the cot and he said in a silly voice, This cot don't hold Bocat. <laughs> well, he tried for a few nights and guess what? The cot didn't hold the book out. <laughs> collapsed on the ground. <laughs> and he ended up sleeping on the floor. But uh, George and I were friends and business partners for 60 years. And if you want to come by our table uh, and uh, see some of the, the memorabilia from the film, photographs mostly, I will show you George's actual sunglasses. When he passed away, his widow wanted me to have some personal items of his, and I have one of those personal items with me, and I'll be happy to show you George's actual Goliath sunglasses. Wow. I think that's a, the best way to end this. Everyone give it up. Thank you.